you know, expendable income I have, why I could buy that card for that price now is because of what Pokemon has done. And I sold some things that are of less consequence to me. So you still sell cards and that's how you're able to. to oh, live. yeah. Yeah. Right. But every, everything is done privately now. I do it through friends right. and in that I don't sell. I think on eBay, I think I have two listings that are absurd amount things. I don't sell anywhere except privately like, you know, through Logan or Steve or, you know, you know, just, just through friends. Pokemon Possum. Hi, Gary. I was wondering, do you have to pay taxes on the trading cards you sell? Man, that's tough. Okay. Since I have to say yes or no, I'm going to say no. The release of Pokemon Go on the 20th anniversary resulted in a resurgence of Pokemon fans. Although it may feel like an eternitus ago, Pokemon Go's release date was on July 6, 2016. During that time, a PSA 10 first edition base at Charizard could be purchased for less than $4,500 US dollars, which is significantly less than the $325,000 price tag that we see today. Charizard would remain at $4,500 from September of 2016 and will stay there until March of 2017, which we then see an inflation rate of 55.55%. Our first edition Lizardons, graded at a 10, are now noted as selling at $7,000 US dollars. Then in June, we get the news that Charizard is now worth $10,000 which means that we're up another 42.86% in less than 90 days, putting these cards at an inflation rate of 122.22% in less than one-third of a year. Then we see the price double to $20,000 the next month, which is now July of 2017, putting us at an inflation rate of 344.44% in less than six months' time. July's massive spike has only one explanation, an event that seems like ages slashes ago and was carefully coordinated by one man to inflate prices and disrupt collectors and players for years to come. A man who would convince the public to treat Pokemon like it's the stock market. Who is also the same man that claims responsibility for how PSA grades Pokemon cards today. And with that, I will explain how this stage was set. With the release of Pokemon Sun and Moon closing out the 20th anniversary celebration in November of 2016, Pokemon Go would remain in the spotlight. But despite controversial news articles, its massive popularity and augmented reality game mechanics would continue to cause Pokemon to grow, resulting in TV shows, YouTubers, and news platforms wanting to cover Pokemon in one way or another. One show in particular wanted to do a segment featuring a large and expensive Pokemon collection. That show was Pawn Stars. And one of its producers had searched through eBay and sorted it based on distance to hopefully find a local collection that would impress viewers. But what they would find is a man who would pull off the biggest scam in Pokemon history and possibly the entire world of collectibles. They, uh, his, his producer did reach out to me and ask me, uh, because Pokemon Go had lit such a fire under the hobby, they wanted to get a Pokemon epi a segment on one of their episodes. And so they reached out to me, and, and they had seen one of my listings that had those Charizards, and it was over 100 PSA 10s, different s types, oh. right? But all Charizards and all, you know, trading TCG. Season 14, Episode 18, better known as Poke Pond, aired on July 10th, 2017. And was uploaded to YouTube later that year on November 13th. Now, Pawn Stars contacted Gary Hayes because of his Charizard collection that he had listed for sale on eBay. So you have probably seen that. That's gotten hundreds of thousands of views. Gary was asked if he was genuinely looking to sell his Charizard collection, which is a pre-qualification question to make sure that people aren't just wanting to go on the show and hype up an item that they have for sale elsewhere. Gary lied and stated yes. 
so he could get on TV with the intentions to hype up the price of his collection, or in his words. And then there was maybe 20 or 25 Beckett's cards. So there was about 100, 120 cards. And so they wanted me to bring those in and negotiate with Rick. They said, would I be interested in selling? And all I'm thinking about is, what is this going to do for the hobby? How big would this be? It's always been my focus is to, there's more stories about the past having to do with this, but it's always been about lifting the hobby, even those recent things with Logan and, yep. and, and that. Uh, and so, you know, right away I said, oh, certainly, you know, I'll do that. And oh, yeah, I'll sell. As he stated, his focus has always been on, quote unquote, lifting up the hobby. Something that Pokemon Go and the new TCG sets, such as Evolutions, were already successful in doing. Gary knew that by going on the show with the prices that he was claiming would cause parents to think that their collections and their children's collections could sell for similar prices, which would then validate his own prices and allow him to further inflate the price of his collection and Pokemon cards in general best part of it was it was the first time a lot of parents saw it and they have their kids playing with pokemon and then they see me there with a <laughs> half a million dollar they yeah. say wait a second it kind of legitimized you know the the investment value right. of pokemon and that and they thought well heck this guy has you know has this stuff and you know anyway it, it did two things it got parents more interested in their kids you know pokemon hobbies plus for, for people who at that time were turning 25, 30 years old, it made them think, wait a second, where's my old Pokemon binder? I've noticed that people that used to collect, they were enthusiasts when they're young, now they go and they watch your community, watch your videos, mm -hmm. and it strikes something in their head. It makes them want to, it makes them want to look further so they watch another one of your videos and then another one of your videos, and all of a sudden they're right back into it. Right. And, uh, because now the memories come flooding it's, back it's in all about that and, and then and next thing you know it's Google 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 eBay you know and they're, and they're, and they're collecting they're getting the newest cards. sets and they're collecting the newest sets and and their kids their kids are going to get into it too so it's kind of like a uh, snowball rolling downhill those young people are growing older they're starting to make right. all the money and they're buying all their memories back that whole thing just worked out so good because it just blew up after that episode yeah. This would also help him draw out additional cards, thus expanding his ever-growing hold on the market. And despite Gary claiming that his love of Pokemon stemmed from his children, we'll soon learn that his interests came out of greed and something much darker. Furthermore, the one-of-a-kind BGS Pristine 10, first edition base at Charizard ending in 888, was purchased for ten thousand nine hundred and ninety-three U.S. dollars, less than one year before the episode. Don't believe me? Here's the Beckett article featuring the guy who graded it. So, if the card recently sold for less than eleven thousand dollars, why would he state that the card is worth fifty to a hundred thousand dollars? A lot of money. Yes. What's your most expensive one? Uh, the most expensive card is probably the Pristine 10 first edition base Charizard. The card itself is considered the crown jewel of the Pokemon world. And how much is that worth? In the range of 50 to 100,000. Whoa. And yeah. people pay that for these? Yeah, especially now with the new Pokemon craze. I know you heard of the new game out. Now, Gary asked for $500,000, which is 110 to $120,000 over market price. And very rarely do you see Rick not even make a single offer and then walk away in the way that he did. Now, here are some of Gary's responses after being shot down. Where they contacted me to go on the show and bring in some Pokemon stuff. And I knew it would be big for the hobby because, you know, they get a lot of a lot of viewership. And so what I did, what I did was uh, I agreed to go on. I told them what I was bringing. But the negotiation was 100% real. Did I plan on selling? No, I didn't want to sell. Uh, I, I set the price at, at the time what market about was, knowing that Rick would not pay market. Oh, yeah. And so I knew I was safe. And then had he decided to pay the full price, full retail, 
I would have tried to find a way out of it. So no, I didn't intend to in, intend to sell, but the negotiation was real. Rick didn't know that, and Chumley didn't know that. But uh, I. And despite what Gary claims about the negotiating part being real and the rest of it being staged, no offers were ever made. Therefore, no negotiating ever took place. Gary will finally acknowledge that Pawn Stars had rightfully quoted him the market price, but he'll never come out and directly say it, at least in front of anyone that wouldn't suck up to him. Now, market for all those at the time might have been in the $400,000 range. Mm -hmm. Altogether, I'm estimating anywhere from three hundred eighty to 390000 for this collection. He'll then excuse and label the extra one hundred and ten dollars to $120,000 as, are you ready, comps. Mm -hmm. uh, at least as well as I could you know, figure it. A lot of mine were one of a kind, so it's a little hard to calculate right. those because there's no you know, well, comps, which you would understand in that. So... Uh, after this episode, we immediately see prices correlate with the prices from the episode, as Gary has caused a Pokemon gold rush, and a lot of people are looking to become what Gary titles himself as Pokey Rich. I'm very, I'm very Pokey Rich. Very Pokey Rich. Gary drops the word possibly in regards to possibly having the world's largest Pokemon collection and claims that he now has the world's largest Pokemon card collection, period. And then he knows it for a fact. However, when he's questioned about his collection, and to verify that it is a fact, he tries to change the subject or weasel his way out of giving any sort of real answer. He'll then attempt to cover up any previous answer given in any other interview by claiming that it was merely an inaccurate statement. No question about this. I have the number one Pokemon card collection. You have the number one Pokemon card collection in the entire world. In the entire world. Wow. Now, and, if in, and if anybody has anything that touches mine, please get in touch. <laughs> please get in touch. First of all, would you say you have the largest Pokemon collection in existence in well, terms of value? Uh, not only do I believe that, but I know that as a fashion. How much would you wow. say the whole collection is worth? Let's hook people from the very beginning. This is the reason why you got to watch this episode. Mm -hmm. Well, and how much do you estimate your entire collection is worth? I wouldn't give it away for less than five thousand. Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. Five million. Five million. Like if Cade walks up and says five million, I say, let's go, let's go get him. Well, now is the time. Can you show off some of your collection? Sure can. The I've never been able to answer that question accurately. Uh, I can tell you that what I brought to show you, you know, uh, I'll give you the value of that. But of all the things that, that we have in storage, yeah. I have no idea what the value is. Plus, Pokemon has been spiking, shooting up so high that the numbers are changing weekly. I, I mean, it's uh, multi-millions, absolutely. But I really yeah. can't be more accurate. Do you, I'd, I'd love yeah. to tell you, maybe do you uh, think someday. It's, do you think it's more than $10 million? It, I, I, it has to be. Yeah, I would say that's safe to say also, <laughs> yes. Uh huh. At first, you might think this guy's afraid of being targeted for such an expensive collection. But he's constantly going on to talk about the prices of the cards. And he even goes on to give away the location of his storage units and what's inside of them multiple times and in multiple interviews. In fact, almost every time he gets in front of the camera, he does it. And I have a lot of items, Pokemon items in my collection that aren't even known to everybody that I have tucked away in Northern California in a storage locker. That's the, yeah, what's the plan? They're, they're not what's... even, they're not, they're, I... Uh, do you know Placerville, California? Yeah. It's like north of Sacramento. Yeah. Uh, that's where they are. I have a storage locker, a special security type storage, you know, there that holds all my best collectibles. And uh, I mean, I might go up there once every two, three years. We're, we are talking about a 10 by 20 stack to the ceiling. Uh, it's, it's a, and it's not, it's not only Pokemon, but the Pokemon is intermixed. And I think it's finally time you know, for them to, you know, go deep into storage, you know. A lot of you know about my uh, California storage locker where I keep, you know, the best of my collections. And I think it's time for these guys, you know, to join there. Uh, 
I've been fortunate all this time, you know, not to, uh, you know, have lost any of these or, or whatever. Oh, will you ever do a video showing your full collection from Joshua? No. I don't mean to sound conspiratorial, but I get the feeling that this might be a Fort Knox conspiracy situation. And that he would claim that he was robbed if he ever had to reveal what's inside. I mean, it literally took listening to one interview, not even closely, mind you, and a single Google search. Now, I'm fairly certain I know where the storage units are and would never attempt to go there. But I can honestly say that security is nowhere near what he claims it to be. So why would you claim that you have the world's biggest collection, the world's most expensive collection of all time, and then proceed to point to where you're storing it all, or at least parts of it? He'll even go on to say that he's storing his most prized and most expensive cards and other items there. Now, Gare Bear also mentions how he's been a collector his whole life and how he collected everything even as a kid, so much that his mother would make him get rid of stuff. Mm. Were you collecting yeah. other cards before you started collecting Pokemon yes, cards? Yes, I have, I'm a lifelong collector, going all the way back to the 1950s. I think in 1959, I was five years old. I collected trading cards, baseball cards. Baseball uh, cards? Oh, absolutely. I still have a, a decent collection, not a super valuable one. Uh, I collected trading cards, the shows from the 1960s, mm -hmm. like Adam's Family and Munsters. I collected all those trading cards, those sets. Uh, I, I like to say that I don't think there's a single set that I either don't own today or didn't own at one time complete. I was at a little bit of a disadvantage early on because my mom and dad and fa family members, nobody were co was collectors. They were all, if there was something too much in the house, get it, get it out. You know, they wanted to keep things neat. And uh, so there was no, there was no interest in collecting. So yeah. I've always had trouble letting things go. I become so attached. So and I guess to someone who doesn't have a, a collecting mentality, how do you explain that, right? Like, how do you derive pleasure from owning something that you hardly ever see? Yeah, because even if you don't see it, the memory is there. It's kind of like if you lose a child, you know, you know, if you lose a child, you don't see the child, but the memories and the feelings are just as strong and they're, and they're there. I do believe that this does play a part in the reason why he collects Pokemon today. Gary claims to have collected every set from every TCG during multiple eras and sports cards as well. Gary also claimed that he once went to Vietnam to purchase cases of Pokemon cards that were on their way to Korea on a boat that got into an accident. What's the furthest you've traveled to collect a Pokemon? Well, Vietnam. You traveled to Vietnam? I had a fellow who had known me from there said uh, there was some kind of a boat accident on the way to Korea or something like that. And they had uh, Pokemon sealed cases and he wanted to know if I'd be interested. He said that there's quite a bit of water damage in that. Yeah. Uh, but would I be interested? So <laughs> got right over there. Now, all this information he shares makes me wonder if his kids had nothing to do with how he fancies Pokemon. Rather, Pokemon was one of the many stashed away opportunities that he I could sell. Yeah, well, I'm very, I'm very pokey rich. Very pokey rich. Oh, a lot of the lot of the you know expendable income I have, why I could buy that card for that price now, is because of what Pokemon has done, and I sold some things that are of less consequence to me. So you still sell cards, and that's how you're able to. to oh live, yeah, yeah. Right? But every everything is done privately now. I do it through friends, right. and in that I don't sell. I think on eBay, I think I have two listings that are absurd amount things. I don't sell anywhere except privately, like, you know, through Logan or Steve or, you know, you know, just, just through friends. Pokemon Possum. Hi, Gary. I was wondering, do you have to pay taxes on the trading cards you sell? Man, that's tough. Okay. Since I have to say yes or no, I'm going to say no. When we focus on some of the personal stories that Gary has shared regarding his family, we're able to confirm that his children are not the reason with how he fancies Pokemon. 
as he had left his family in the U.S. while he had a romantic relationship with a co-worker in Vietnam. Tuan, come here a minute. Come here a minute. Meeting Queen Pokemon. Yes, uh huh. <laughs> Queen Pokemon. Pokemans. Yeah. <laughs> come here a minute. Hey, come on in. C- come over here. Say hello. I seriously hate how he calls her and points for where he wants her to stand. He then reminds her of the whole experience as if it were a cue to stick to a set of lines. Yeah, we're we're talking about uh, when we met in Vietnam. Okay. And and you had hadn't heard about Pokemon at the time, you know, over Not there, and uh, and yet uh, you know we we're just kind of telling our story. At the oh. time, he said uh, he had nothing, but okay. he has a lot of cocks, and uh, he just said, "Come over here, visit." And then, if five years later you stay here for five years, if five years later you don't like it, then you can go, we go five back. Five years, yeah. Five, five years, years that's a long, long time. time. Yeah. yeah. Well, five years, you know, by then you're settled. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why that's he's smart and not, yeah. yes. That was the and plan in the say, beginning. And then I fell in love. Oh, I was the director of a resort, casino, yeah. hotel, right on the South China Sea. And uh, Tuan was hired to be the assistant director. Plus, she spoke multiple languages, which I needed because very few people spoke English yeah. there. And, uh, and so we fell in love, and I told her, just come back for that five years. And, five and years. if you, because my sons, <laughs> yeah, my sons, sell. yeah, my you sons would be, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. my sons would be, we're like 14, 15, they'd be 19, 20. Yeah. And then I'd feel okay about going. I said, yeah. and if you're not happy after five years, That's I'll right. go with you back to Vietnam yeah. and I'll live there the rest of my life. Right. And I was, I do what I say. Was that you the Pawn Stars promise? The yeah. Pawn Stars <laughs> promise. <laughs> 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 like, please, please. Five right. years, try to get out of it. Yeah. yeah. But what I want to know is where was his son's birth mom? Where was mommy number one? Did King Pokemon pull a King Henry VIII? But then we find out that he begged her to come back to the U.S. with him. And that she slash they could go back to Vietnam only after spending five years in the U.S. with him. And he claims that it was only because his sons at the time would be adults. Gary states that his boys were around 14, 15 at the time. And furthermore, a recent Input Mag article mentions that his son Devin is 28 years old. Now this adds up, but it's actually one of the few times that Gary truthfully states the age of his children. But in addition to running off to another country and leaving his sons behind, which he never explains why, he also confesses to intentionally trying to harm them. In 1997, Gary had read an article in Yahoo News about how an episode of Pokemon caused over 700 people in Japan to have seizures and become hospitalized. This episode was Electric Soldier Porygon, and it was due to a lot of flashing lights. Gary, thinking that it was cool, wanted to show his kids, hoping that they would have a reaction to it. Don't believe me? Here's him saying it. I remember in 1997 or 1998, uh, in that area, I remember a news article that came out that talked about a cartoon episode in Japan that was causing a lot of kids to uh, go into tremors and hallucinations and things like that. I remember that, the seizures. The seizures. I remember that. Yes. That was a flashing episode. Yes. And the legitimate seizures, you know, being physically affected by that. And I don't know, I remember thinking, oh, cool. You know, I said, this must be real. <laughs> this must be really, you know, really neat. And so there was an internet back then. Uh, and I did, you know, internet searches and that and did find it. You know, I watched it and it totally, I was hoping it would affect one of my kids. They were maybe eight, nine, ten years old, you know, at the time. At the time, I had my two uh, youngest sons were seven and eight years old. And so I identified with, you know, what was happening to those kids. But when I heard that, I remember my first thought was, well, that's pretty cool. You know, <laughs> of course, it was serious yeah. back then. Uh, and I did, you know, internet searches and that and did find it. 
you know, I watched it, and it totally, I was hoping it would affect one of my kids. They were maybe eight, nine, ten years old, you know, at the time. Now, his son, Devin, was four to five years old at the time that he did this, meaning that Gary was trying to get a four to five year old kid to have an epileptic seizure. Seriously, what kind of father does that and openly laughs about how he was hoping it would affect them? According to various articles, over 685 children were taken to hospitals. Two remained hospitalized for more than two weeks. And here he is laughing about it, hoping that his kids are going to be a part of it. So again, I don't think Gary being into Pokemon was because of his kids. To further confirm this, let's take a look at a video where King Pokemon is selling off 16% ownership of the same cards that he said were going to go to his sons when he died. Hey everyone, this is S.M. Pratt, and you can tell that I'm in a different location by the uh, Jumbo Charmander we got here. But I flew into, you probably know where, by this guy, I flew into Vegas to actually record a pretty important deal that is taking place on July 6th of 2018. And if Gary, or this is Steve, Steve. here, to the right, if either one of you want to explain or give a quick summary of what's going on. Yeah, well, it's great to have these guys here. We're doing a big deal, and Scott uh, flew out here to Vegas from Missouri uh, to do the filming and to do the research on what we're doing and that. And then my one of my very best friends, Steve, is out here from Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, we're... We're doing a deal. He's buying into my collection, you know, so we're going to be partners in, uh, in my Charizard collection, a 21 card collection, not my entire thing. Now, this isn't the first time that we've seen Steve. Steve has actually been around for quite some time, and we can see him in the background of the episode of Pawn Stars, and he's actually the one holding the cards and Gary's eBay listing. Uh, this is what uh, Stephen and I are going partners on. It's going to include uh, one of the two pristine Charizards. This is the uh, one that you recently saw on Leon Hart, the one we showed on Leon Hart that I flew to Dallas to purchase. Yeah, so for people who are worried that you won't see that monumental listing on eBay, these still will be in that massive <laughs> listing on eBay. Yes. Uh, what it is is a percentage ownership mm -hmm. and... I would say this is probably the most significant chunk uh, in that lot on eBay, mm -hmm. for sure. At least these are the, the all-star team right here. Yes. But, but, yeah, that's pretty much everything we have. The only other thing is, if you'd like to see the actual cash, <laughs> this is Vegas, and this is how people transact in Vegas. <laughs> and actually, Steve came over through TSA, so these, this transaction is also TSA approved. <laughs> this came through the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't they stop you, Steve, at the airport? And... Yeah, they stopped me asking you questions. Uh, where am I going such amount of money? And mm -hmm. if I take this money from the bank voluntarily, mm -hmm. somebody put the pressure on me right. if I do this by myself, my yeah. own will, my free yeah. own will. Just tell them it's Pokemon. So I really hope things are starting to click for everyone uh, right now. These are stacks of $10,000 in each pile. But Steve is buying 16% ownership 10, at 81000 so US dollars. 20 Meaning the estimated value of these cards 30, is now 506250 50. So once was a collection 60, of over 100 cards for $500,000 is now a collection of only 21 70. cards. This doesn't have a band. Now, I believe that this video 80. is another attempt to validate Gary's prices. Then 80. Now, now we, Steve and I, have been friends like brothers for years. And we've done many, many dealings together. And we've done many, many dealings together. Uh, and we've done many, many dealings together. Absolutely. It's like I said, because we're brothers. And Gary will go on to explain about how his kids and Steve will have to decide of who buys out who whenever Gary dies. This whole thing seems like one big mess. And I think it's safe to say that this might turn into a giant legal battle for them. 
he had been after me for years. He's been a great friend, almost like a brother. Uh, this is Steve, who I did the transaction with uh, for many years. Plus, he's been a great customer on top of all that, bought a lot of money and stuff and different types of collectible items. And he's been after me to buy my Charizard collection all these years. Uh, well, finally, basically, to shut him up, uh, <laughs> I, I had to figure out a way to let him in. And so... Uh, the way that transaction went, if it wasn't clear in the video, was uh, he gave me $81,000. The estimated value of the 21 cards he went partners mm -hmm. with uh, is about $500,000. I get to hold the cards until I die. When I die, things are written up and legal and, and uh, you know, what's going to happen from there. Where he's, where he's, where he's going to get a chance to buy out the collection or uh, my wife and kids will have a chance to, uh, you know, to, you know, to make, you know, to make the, to make it fair, you know, refund money based on our current market value. Hopefully that will be 20, 30 years from now. I would say this is probably the most significant chunk uh, in that lot on eBay. Mm -hmm. So the most significant cards in King Pokemon's collection that make him who he is, that he swore he would never sell, he has sold off partial ownership of. This means that King Pokemon doesn't fully own his cards. Ownership is now split between Gary and Steve. Does this mean that there are now two King Pokemon? Does this make Steve Prince Pokemon or Pokemon Prince? How many other times has Gary sold 16% ownership? Or any percentage of ownership? What percentage of ownership has Gary sold through private dealings? How much in taxes has Gary not paid? Whether it be in earnings or simply sales tax. A lot of the lot of the, you know, expendable income I have why I could buy that card for that price now is because of what Pokemon has done, and I sold some things that are of less consequence to me. So you still sell cards, and that's how you're able to. to oh leave. yeah, yeah. Right. But every everything is done privately now. I do it through friends, right. and in that I don't sell. I think on eBay, I think I have two listings that are absurd amount things. I don't sell anywhere except privately, like you know through Logan or Steve or you know you know just just through friends. Pokemon Possum. Hi, Gary. I was wondering, do you have to pay taxes on the trading cards you sell? Man, that's tough. Okay. Since I have to say yes or no, I'm going to say no. And I think the worst part about this deal is the fact that Gary's kids and Steve are more than likely going to get into a legal battle when Gary passes away. Because what happens if one party wants to sell while the other party doesn't want to sell? Where are the cards going to be placed after Gary passes away? What's going to happen if either party goes to Gary's storage lockers and they're not in there? There is a ton of money exchanging hands over these cards. And a lot of it isn't being documented. The only documentation going on here is by the same party that claims that they don't have to pay taxes, they're doing other deals privately, they're claiming that they would never sell to begin with, and that their entire goal is to hype up the value of these cards. There is something else going on here that none of us know about yet. In the meantime, Gary is continuously raising the price of his two Beckett graded pristine 10 first edition Charizards. How much is that worth? In the range of 50 to 100,000. Whoa. And yeah. people pay that for these. First edition base Charizards. And this one happens to be signed by the illustrator Arita. Charizard, it's a, it's a... I love how Mr. King Pokemon will go on channels such as Leonhart or Real Breaking Nate to brag about the price of the card and to inflate the price of the card. In the meantime, he'll brag about how it's signed by Mitsuhiro Rita. But here's what he has to say about the artist and his signature whenever he thinks a different type of audience is listening. Yeah. Uh, Arita, who did design 
that Charizard, uh, and it's signed on the case, not the card. Right. I mean, never would you no. let him <laughs> sign that card because that's extremely special. Wait, who signed this? Uh, Arita. Me- the artist Mitsurito. Of this card. Yeah, yeah, the artist. This is his most expensive card that he's sitting here trying to brag about, that he's supposed to know everything about. Because after all, he's King Pokemon, but he can't even pronounce the name of the illustrator correctly. It's Mitsuhiro Arita. Yeah, but which in a, in a lot of cases, that's a big deal. But this card is such a big deal, his signature means nothing. So the case is signed by the original illustrator himself. Uh, whether you leave that on there or not, I know that'll kind of be up to you with well, that. Well, I'll tell but... you, it's pretty cool having it on there. Uh, my other one does not have it. So this is actually a one of a kind. Yeah, I, I could take, I, I, I'm tempted to take it off of there. Of Why? The, it's just on the case. It's not on the card. But this card is such a big deal. His signature means nothing. Not only is his statement ignorant and disrespectful to the illustrator, but it further proves that he doesn't truly care about Pokemon, only the stupid plastic slab and label that he can put a price tag on. But here's what he also had to say about the Pokemon creators and Pokemon in general. And, and I believe too often Pokemon, uh, the Pokemon creators and, that, and the marketing departments gear it a little bit towards a younger age and the player's age instead of the collector's. I mean, this is a collector's game, I, you know, 100%. So I originally had a two-hour version of this video planned, and I was in the process of editing it. I had clips of him talking about how he loans people money in exchange for their Pokemon cards, and then sells them back at his rates. Clips where he talks about losing a bunch of money gambling. And I was even going to cover how he celebrated 20,000 subscribers before he even had 9,000 subscribers. There are endless videos of Gary contradicting himself. So much to the point where Gary eventually started scripting his responses, and you can even see him reading those responses in some of the clips I've featured. He couldn't even consistently lie about his appearance on Pawn Stars, nor the negotiation that never took place. Now, Gary is scheduled to do a meet and greet at the Collecticon Artist Convention, I mean Collecticon Convention, this year on June 26th and June 27th at 10 a.m. through 6 p.m. Now, Collecticon can be summed up by two things. One, overpriced vendor booths, and two, YouTubers trying to act like rock stars, which neither of those things are of interest to me. But if you guys get a chance and make it out there, I encourage you to attend Gary's meet and greet and ask him the following. One, why did you abandon your family to run off to Vietnam? Two, Why do you constantly brag about your collection and where it's located, but yet you're never willing to show it? Three, how much money have you made off of private deals? And four, why does Steve, the man who owns 16% of your most significant cards in your collection, never make an appearance with you? And I want to ask you, the viewers, to think about the following. What percentage of ownership do you think Gary still has? How much is enough for this man? He is setting his own prices, continuing to inflate these cards, and using others around him and their reputations to help him inflate those prices. He is making these cards unobtainable for many, resulting in increased violent crimes over Pokemon cards. He is pushing people out of the hobby, and this thing is a bubble, and it is going to burst, but he is telling everyone that everything is okay while he secretly sells off the cards that he said he never would, while keeping a small percentage of ownership to himself, that way he can keep the cards in his possession, while creating the illusion that he never sells. An inflation rate of 8,996.7% in less than four years is in no way healthy. What other items have had this much inflation and not been a bubble? And for those of you who are still wondering, what does this man have to do with this most recent spike? We're actually here to, uh, and I'm kind of like embarrassed to say this, <laughs> buy a, uh, yeah, you guessed it, a Pokemon card. Or attempt to buy anyway. Okay, so Pawn Stars, the show. We all know it, we all love it. About three years ago, a guy named Gary went on the show. He had like a beautiful Charizard collection. He wanted half a million dollars for it. The guy said no. Today, that collection is worth five million. <laughs> 
I've actually tried to buy a 10 Charizard from him before, and he actually told me he'd never sell it. And I'm not good at taking no for an answer, so I've come here to Las Vegas today. Look how many he has, bro. <laughs> all shadowless. Wait, Gary, Gary, they're yeah. all shadowless. Says I'm holding. Gary, I'm holding a million dollars in my hand. I know. Because when you went on Pawn Stars, yes, you were asking for half a million dollars. Yes. I remember checking TCG Player when this premiered, and every single card on that site was overly priced. It was like every boomer thought they had a Charizard. When you see Badoofs getting priced over ten dollars, no matter what set they're from you know prices are getting inflated. 1999 when it started, my son going to bed, peeking in, staring at that Charizard, the first one that we ever pulled, mm. and then falling asleep the next morning, still having it in his hand. So wow. cool. Even though Do you think Gary told them about the time that he abandoned his children to run off to Vietnam? Were you really planning on selling those cards? Not really. You just did it for clout. What are those cards worth today? That's probably about 10 million. 10 million? You've got to be kidding me. Logan just said $5 million. Today, that collection is worth $5 million. See, this is what I'm talking about. Even with Logan Paul backing him up, he came and consistently carry a lie in the same video. How does he keep getting away with this? Now, again, there is a ton I had to edit out of this video, but there are certain clips that I couldn't just part with. Here they are. Pokemon trainers. If you will, the people that bought the, the packs, all right here. What? 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 Oh, oh, ZHC? So, this amazing Charizard is done by ZHC, YouTube, uh, the YouTube mastermind. I love this guy. His team came here and they did this amazing, like, this whole room is, is all ZHC art. And so just shout out ZHC YouTube. He's, he's, he's the man. I love this guy. And, uh, so actually my heart is with the Shadowless, but then there's okay. something else. Uh, maybe, maybe you've seen uh, people have been using fake stamps. I don't know really? if you ever no, discussed. Really? No, I didn't even have Do you ever discuss that? No, I, I've, I've done videos mm -hmm. as far as like uh, how to tell if cards are fake. Oh, okay. And so, so your community is aware of that. Oh, they're absolutely aware. Oh, they, okay. they love it when we tell them how to spot fake Pokemon cards. Okay. Well, one thing about uh, fake first edition stamps mm -hmm. is you can put it, you can put it on a shadowless card. You can somehow some of these guys are pretty good. They can put a first edition stamp on there. Okay. Uh -huh. But you can't fake a shadowless card. Maybe you can fake a first edition. Yeah. But you can't fake a shadowless card because a shadowless card has nothing there. So right. th there was a post recently. Are you familiar with uh, the girl Caribou? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, now she ran a real hit piece on, on the hobby, on scalpers and everything. Mm -hmm. And I have always contended that uh, also my picture was put on there too, mm -hmm. which I didn't appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody who loves the hobby and cares about the hobby and has done as much as I've done to put me in a critical light. You yeah. know, I didn't appreciate that at all. But uh, what my biggest complaint was blaming everybody except who's responsible for this whole thing. You know, blaming the scalpers, blaming the uh, influencers, blaming all the guys opening boxes, guys hoarding boxes. Uh, and not blaming, you know, the Pokemon Company International, you know, the ones that can fill the demand, the ones who supply the product. And I thought, and I thought, whoa, I said, this, this is just awful. Now, having complaints, being critical is all perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. But to, but to make that, you know, the whole centerpiece of a, of a diatribe is, is uh, just out of line to me. Yeah. You know, there's, 90% positive in this hobby and there's 10% negative. So keep your content that way. Well, in other words, this, this stuff happens, this stuff happens. And of course people are going to, you know, take advantage of it, you know, mm -hmm. money wise. Well, you, you know, Scott Pratt had a great line. I saw on E4 about this, whereas he said he started watching her art, her, uh, her uh, video. and when she got to the point where she said, you know, that the that you you couldn't get that there was just no hidden fates, you know, you would travel the entire state, couldn't find any. And Scott's Scott said he immediately typed in hidden fates on eBay 
and there were 3,500 hidden fates listings yeah. for everything yeah. from single cards to packs to boxes. So you, now were there price increases? You know, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, that's just what's going to happen. But, but I thought he had a great line. He said he stopped watching her video at that point. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, whoa, that's hysterical, Gare Bear. As in Pratt sure got her. Now let's listen to what he has to say about how him and his little girl couldn't go in McDonald's and buy cases of Pokemon things. Seriously, that's what he calls them. I've got one last question for you. What do you think about all the modern stuff, about all the scalpers going and grabbing up all the product and selling them online? Do you, do you think that that's good, sucks, okay, or are they making a profit? I mean, I see both sides of it, mm -hmm. but I would love to know your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, it's funny. On a, on a personal level, uh, I'm not a big fan of it. I'm not a big fan. I, I went into, I wanted to buy my little girl, my six-year-old, uh, something while she was in therapy last week. And so I went to the Best Buy where they have a big Pokemon, you know, section, you know, multi-shelves and that. Sure. I went in there. It was totally empty. There Every, was not, there was not, you go. there was not one thing on that shelf I could buy that was Pokemon related. And I, I felt so bad. I took a picture of it and posted it on my Instagram. You'll see it on my Instagram showing the empty shelf and saying that, you know, you know, that something needs to be done about this. Yes, that was the real picture he posted to his Instagram. You get McDonald's managers and franchise owners taking the, you know, the thousand packs and selling them privately and then just putting a sign out front it's saying, yes, they put a sign out front saying, sorry, we're out of Pokemon things. I mean, I mean, I, I went, I've, I've gone in four times now into McDonald's to get a happy meal for my daughter and, uh, the, I, I went in many times, but four times I was able to get a Pokemon thing. Oh, no. Gear Bear had to get out of his car four whole times just to get that Pokemon thing? I guess him having to get out of his car and not being able to buy cases of Pokemon cards was, was Pokemon's fault, too. It has nothing to do with artificial inflated prices. So you know what? I got you, Gear Bear. I got you and your little girl, too. Let me help you out here. We're going to get you some Pokemon cards. All right, McDonald's Pokemon cards. Boom. Look at that, Gear Bear. There's over 13,700 results. Yeah, they might be search packs. Yeah, they might be overpriced. But hey, in your words... In well, other words, this this stuff happens. This stuff happens, and of course, people are gonna you know take advantage of it. You know, mm -hmm. money wise. What my biggest complaint was blaming everybody except who's responsible for this whole thing. You know, blaming the scalpers, blaming the uh, influencers, blaming all the guys opening boxes, guys hoarding boxes. Uh, and not blaming, you know, the Pokemon Company International, you know, the ones that can fill the demand, the ones who supply the product. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the fault lies. Now, before I go, I want to say thank you to all of my slow bros and ho-ohs, to everyone who has supported me so far. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We recently passed 151 subscribers. And even though we're a small channel right now, I get excited to share information and shed light on things like this with you all.